As noted, hi, I'm Oren Shaw. As you may have already guessed at some level, I am a DevOps expert who is deeply focused on tech culture. Uh, you may have even heard me speak previously on the subject. You may have also noticed me par participating in the third longest running internet argument going, also known as Twitter. By day, I'm founder and principal DevOps culturalist at IR Limited, and we're based out of Wellington. And one of the core things we work on is ensuring the success of technological change by focusing on the cultural and organizational side of ensuring those technological changes. And as a DevOps, one of the many things I work with is AWS Lambda. And yes, this, this whole serverless thing, this is cool. I am on board with this. I love that I get, you know, for free even, all the infrastructure I need to just run code. IO is handled, API access is handled. Mostly I write Python, so with some whiskey wrapper, wrappers, well, I'm, I'm done. It's easy, it's straightforward. I love this. This, this is the power, the promise of serverless. The power to think about my system in decomposed pieces, lots of little parts moving and communicating together. It takes that microservices mindset and it really, really forces you into that worldview. It forces us into a decoupled mindset. I'm gonna put my water down. Forces us into thinking about our APIs. Forces us into thinking about interface stability. Because we're cooking in someone else's kitchen, all of these decisions are made for us. Our pattern, our pattern is already set. We're in it. This is, this is great, yay. <laughs> however, um, and, you know, there's always a however, and the however is really important. The however is that you and I, you know, we're on board with these design patterns. We're here at a conference for serverless. We're talking about serverless. We're in the know. And even if we haven't deployed serverless tech in ourselves, we still think it's a viable future. And there's gonna be so many good stories today. There was already good stories this morning of people deploying serverless, building serverless, using serverless, and doing great work with serverless. And I could tell you my own stories, building CI CD pipelines, tools that I've written, the customers that I'm working with, really dive into the technical nuts and bolts of this future. Instead, I want to ask, what about everyone else, the people who aren't here? Your teammates who scoff at the idea. Your boss, your boss's boss. Are you engaging in a DevOps process? If you're not, what about your sysadmin team? Are they on board? Project management. Are they on board? Your architects. QA. Support. And this is where I often will start to hear grumbling. Because how often are these people on board? How often are they willing to listen to us, to listen to these ideas? Because we know these are good ideas. We know this design pattern has legs. We know the serverless revolution is here. So, you know, why won't they get on board? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the, and the reason is the title of my talk, that these design ideas aren't enough. They won't, they aren't, they won't be enough. They can not ever be <coughs> enough. I'm kind of about the visual gag sometimes, so. But Oren, you exclaim, what do you mean? This is a good technology, and good technology should always win, right? Well, <laughs> you, yeah, maybe you've, you've encountered this answer before. Um, to answer that, I actually want to cover some underlying assumptions on the nature of technology, the nature of change, the nature of our organizations. And in so doing, we can answer why being good can never be enough why serverless alone can't save us. So the first question we must ask is, what is technology? And technology has a really straightforward answer as to what it is, right? Well, actually, it really does. At its most fundamental, 
Technology is a force amplifier. It improves our ability to reach a goal. It makes it easier to achieve tasks. That's it. That is all technology is. This stretches back from the earliest technology that we mastered, which was fire, by the way, which you know, amplified our ability to extract nutrition from our food. Another early technology would be the bow and arrow, which amplified our ability to throw sharp sticks at potential food. Or agriculture, which kicked off our ability to build civilization, to build cities, to centralize. It amplified our ability to have food safety. This technology led directly to you being here listening to me. It affects everything that we make, everything that we do, every technology that we build exists solely to improve someone's ability to achieve a goal. But technology is more than that. It's an amplifier, but it's not neutral. It exists, but it doesn't just exist. It exists to serve a purpose. And so when I say it's not neutral, that lack of neutrality is best expressed by, well, you may have noticed the idea all technology is political has been coming up a lot lately. And that's what I'm getting at with neutrality. This is true. All technology is political. And when I say this, I'm not using it to refer to left-wing versus right-wing framing. Instead, I mean of people. Technology is of people. It is made by people. And being of people, well, people have assumptions. We have worldviews, outlooks. We exist within social structures. We make choices based on those structures. And because technologies exist to amplify force, it means the technologies must carry the politics of which forces should be amplified. So every technology carries its assumptions within itself. It must exist within its own framework. Let's explore what I mean by that. Let's think about writing, literacy as a whole. And we all think of this as unequivocally good, because it is. It lets us distribute and persist ideas at a scale we never could before. It lets us write documentation. It also means we are no longer bound by the slow and sometimes lossy systems of oral tradition. And that's the assumption. That's the politics. That we should break from oral traditions. That it's better to disseminate ideas as far as we can and as fast as we can. And I mean, it carries questions as well. Like, is this worth writing down? And this got asked a lot about oral traditions. Were they worth recording? It used to be that books were really expensive to make. Printing was very expensive to perform. So we made value judgments about what should be recorded. And those assumptions, those politics, create what literacy means today. It even creates the language that we have. This letter is thorn. It used to be a part of English. It got dropped because it's inconvenient. And it's inconvenient because printers would buy movable type, often importing it from Germany or Italy. And these are languages that don't use the thorn. So the printers would replace the thorn with the capital Y, or eventually, as we know, TH. That's what thorn means. So anytime you see ye old, it's actually the old. The Y is pronounced th. How about roads? We think of these as good. The assumption is that it should be easy to get around, easy to move goods and armies around. And this, as a side effect, contributed to making our civilization what it is, made it easier, even more easy than agriculture to centralize. Today, it enables modern just-in-time logistics. For a lot of you, it made it possible for you to get here to see me at all. The roads themselves have politics. What should we connect to the road? How good should that road be? Does your town or city deserve highways, paved roads? Just a gravel track. And the politics of these choices reflect our broader context. Good roads belong near important shipping points, ports, for instance. We could also think of steam power as a political technology that we should 
amplify the force of laborers far beyond what sheer muscle is capable of, far faster than human ability. This led to factories, to the Industrial Revolution. This did have political ramifications. We're all familiar with the idea of Luddites, the Luddite movement. They objected politically to these ideas, but more to the inbuilt, the inbuilt assumption of good within those ideas. And I picked these examples because they're far enough away that the arguments for and against are no longer emotional. They're by and large over. We, we chose these paths. We're living with the ramifications. The distance does make it a bit hard to see those associated, some associated assumptions because we've internalized the politics. They're the status quo. They are what we've accepted. So what about a more recent technology? What about the internet? What assumptions does the internet carry? The history of the internet starts with ARPANET in the 1960s. This was a project to ensure that communication continue, could continue in the face of, well, in the face of the Cold War ending very badly for everyone involved. And the core assumption, therefore, is in enabling and maintaining communication in the face of catastrophic damage, any damage. As the internet grew, enabling communication meant across the globe. If you notice, this globe does not have New Zealand on it. Or maybe it does right on the rim, you just can't see it. <sighs> Hashtag maps. Um, this turned into anyone anywhere, but still designed to work around damage, which gives us a design that carries ideas. It must carry ideas of freedom of communication and ensuring that communication is very difficult to suppress, which means that the internet carries freedom of speech. The internet treats breaks in communication as damage and routes around. You may have also heard of this referred to as the Streisand effect. And if you're not familiar with the Streisand effect, the Streisand effect is so named because famous actress Barbara Streisand tried to have aerial photography of, that had been published in the internet of her house suppressed. And the internet responds as the internet does with, hello, everyone should now have this. Here you go, please pass it on. Thank you. This also happened with DCSS, if you remember from the early 2000s. And like, these are two of many, many examples. But the underlying assumption is that communication must not be suppressed. It must be free. But that underlying assumption of free speech is invisible. Again, because we've internalized these ideas. Freedom of speech in New Zealand is a given. It's normal. But the idea of you should have that free speech gets carried along with the internet. It is intrinsically linked to the idea of the internet. It is inescapable. And we do recognize this effect, this effect of technology being driven by politics. We have a name for it. Necessity is the mother of invention. What we need, we make. But my needs aren't yours. Yours aren't mine. The things I make will have different assumptions built in, different, different takes on those needs. And I've seen this effect several times over. For instance, when Ruby on Rails came out, it was from a viewpoint where the needs were not met. Or when Node.js came out, it was from a viewpoint where needs were not met. And these technologies make assumptions. They came from the worldviews of their makers. This shows us how technology embeds politics. We have a name for that particular phenomenon too, which is Conway's Law, which if you haven't heard of that says, Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Excuse me. Everything we build is a system. The products of our organizations carry our structures. They carry our politics. My solution will have different beliefs on how force should be amplified, baked in the very idea of that technology. And you know, Ruby on Rails, I want to touch on that again, really captures this idea, the idea of 
omakaze, of opinionated software, of convention over configuration. This is politics. This is the politics of Rails. It was defined against Java and how you build Java applications. These politics, though, come with it. You get them when you take Rails. And this isn't good or bad. It merely is the way it is. It's important. But why is it important? To answer that, we need to think about organizations and about context. So, what is context? Well, the context, our context is the social structures that surround us. In our organizations, this is our culture. And our culture is our culture. It is a tautology. What is, is. It is the result of the choices we made that we didn't make, that we didn't know that we were making. This makes it a social system that dictates what is and is not possible, what is and is not acceptable. And I bring this up because, well, let's talk about black swan events. And for those of you who haven't heard about a, haven't heard the idea of black swan events, it is, well, a surprise. Specifically, the canonical example being the surprise of only ever having seen white swans and making the fairly reasonable assumption that only white swans exist. Until you get to Western Australia for the very first time and surprise black swans. And I'm bringing this up, this, I'm bringing it up because the idea of a black swan event is that dramatic reevaluation, that huge context shift. In this case, our taxonomy of swan changed. Our category theory of swan changed. The entire idea of phylogenetics started to happen. What else gets these forced reevaluations? What else do we discover is false? And we can look at technologies in the same light. We can call them black swan technologies. In the 1960s, when they invented the internet, no one could have foreseen that it would become what it is today that it would completely and fundamentally rewrite so much of our culture and society. The idea of black swan events also speaks to their inevitability, that we could look back and say, oh yeah, that, that was totally gonna happen, using the benefit of hindsight. And while that is a part of it, it's not the point I'm trying to make. Instead, the other way I wanna look at, at black swan events is as an uh, out of context problem. And the reason I prefer this frame is that it captures what I'm driving towards. Like if we take something like, the more generically, the cloud. It has been just over 12 years since the cloud launched. 12 years since arguably a major black swan event. And there are still companies who can't use it, who don't use it, because it's outside their context. It doesn't make sense, because it was and remains an out-of-context solution. And that itself is a reversal of the idea of the black swan event. It reframes it with the, inversal, the inverse of Conway's law. And because I haven't talked about that yet, what would the inverse of Conway's law be? Well, if Conway's law tells us that organizations produce co copies of their communication structures, the inverse must be that using a technology means we must accept its politics and its assumptions. Which, as we've touched on already, means that we think we should have roads that we should be able to read. That our travel should not just be possible, but easy. That the words that we write down have worth and meaning and value and should be easily propagated that we should have ubiquitous access to the vastness of recorded knowledge, to cheap and easy communication with all of our friends and loved ones, that we should pay for that with advertising. But this also tells us that our organizations already know how to communicate. They already know how to find solutions to problems. They already know what solutions look like. We know what they're permitted to look like. So when we talk about serverless, it is a solution. 
It is 100% a solution to a wide range of problems that a lot of people have, and we're going to hear lots of stories about that truth. But for existing organizations, it can, does not look like a solution. It doesn't make sense. Because for an organization with existing structures, existing communication, existing processes, why would I want this? How would I monitor it with my existing tools? How would I test it with my existing process? How would I make it fit with what I have? These are cultural demands, the cultural system, the specific set of contexts that drive what choices that we are able to make. And when we look at serverless in these terms, it struggles to make sense because it violates those contexts. Contexts. It opposes the cultures that we have built at our organizations. And this creates friction, frustration. It creates the question, why won't they just change? And the answer is, they can't. And they can't because the default culture that gets built is one that is built to resist. Let's unpack what I mean when I say that. And cultures exist within a context, and context is built upon our past choices, the processes that have built up over time. And processes and policy are choices that we made, choices that we didn't make, choices that we didn't know we were making. Choices made so they don't have to be made again. We've thought about that problem. We've solved it. We're done now. I know what size widgets to buy from here on out. And that's the generator of stasis. Not only have we made that choice and written down what we chose, but we tell each other what the choice was. We tell newcomers what the choice was. We make new decisions based on that choice. The newcomers tell newer comers. And new choices are made from that choice that was made all the way back to that starting choice. A choice made in a time and a place with surrounding rules and goals and desires that are different from today. And these processes and policies, these choices from the past, create walls and boundaries, not by telling us what we can or cannot do, but by telling us how we will be measured and judged, and if we will be found wanting. So resistance to change is not built on a fear of change, but a fear of being seen as incompetent, as unable to meet goals and objectives, of existing in a culture and understanding that culture, knowing what choices were made and how best to make new choices and then being cast into the uncertainty of a new system with new rules and goals and outcomes and desires. And that is a social system. This is a social system with social constraints and social outcomes. And these social systems, not technical choices or the falsehood idea of technical merit, dictate what our choices can be. And this is you know, the point where you will probably say something like, Oren, this is terrible. This is bad. This is limiting. We need to throw all of this away, and we need to start over. And cool, I'm really glad you brought that up. Because there are two things there I want to talk about that derive from that goal, that, that desire to reset. And the first idea is that once you have a process, that's it. You cannot unhave a process. It's there forever because it influences all choices that come thereafter. It becomes your context, and it can not stop being your context. Because any choice made afterwards is influenced by the presence of that process, including the choice to remove that process. It itself is informed by the process. Its legacy will remain in every choice that happens after, because the new process is defined by how it is not the process that was before. The second idea, the second idea is going to be a lot harder for you to hear because the second idea is very challenging. And the second idea is that if you think this state of affairs is bad, this context is bad, and you are frustrated by it, 
I'm sorry, but that's irrelevant. Your opinions on the process and context of your organization do not matter. And that is hard to hear. Because we're taught to think that what we think is important, that our opinions have weight, have meaning, that they have value. But the process is still the process, and the context is still the context. What is, is, and it exists. It exists regardless of our, cho of our desires to the contrary. It exists because all of us must choose to participate in it, because it is bigger than any one of us, because it judges our performance, the performance of others. It judges whether we belong. But that's okay. We know how it works. We can plan around it. It's just normal. And maintaining that normality gives us safety. It requires that we be static, to consider changes abnormal, to do things wrong, which means that we are unable to adapt organizationally to new technologies. They require changing the status quo. They require adopting new politics and new process. And when we're looking at out-of-context solutions, like migrating to or using serverless, this radical new technology, this new approach to design and deployment, we are looking at a black swan, a concept outside of organizational context, a concept that is not technically good or bad. Objective technological goodness does not exist, but merely serverless has incompatible politics. And our context does not care that we disagree. Our context still exists, what is, is. And this itself is just an outcome. It's not good or bad. It itself merely exists. It's a tautology. What is, is. And I recognize this is all a bit heavy for just after morning tea, but I am bringing it up for a reason. And the reason is that these ideas are fundamental. And as hard as they are to hear, I'm bringing them up because they tell us so, so much. They tell us how to look at our organizations, at our bosses, at our teammates. They give us the frame of mind to look at why they're not on board, what pressures and forces are keeping them from change. It lets us look at ourselves, see why we are on board, what allows us to be on board, what that means for what we do. We're on board because we adopted these politics, that we could adopt these politics, that we think these are good ideas, worthwhile solutions, but more critically, that we're allowed to think that these are worthwhile solutions. And this gives us a framework. It gives us a way of looking at the world that lets us answer, why are they saying no? What prevents them? What are their needs? And how are they not being met? So what does this let us do? It teaches us how to think, how to think about the nature of what we're asking. Because we're not asking for people to think that what we're doing is OK or exciting. We are asking them to change their politics, the ways that they decide what is and is not acceptable or even possible. And as we touched on, this isn't change is scary. It's a threat to my competence to my ability to feel competent, to my ability to project competence, the ability to have value to an organization. This is a change of context. These are out of context solutions. And we need to understand that as much as you and I do, they exist in an organization that does not notice their opinions, that imposes constraints based on its past and the choices made knowing or not. This framework also shows us how to think about change. If change is a function of context, change must exist within the needs and goals of the organization around it. It tells us how to initiate that change. And it's actually very straightforward. But it won't be easy. Because finding their context is the first step, the most important, the most overlooked part, because what we think is important is not what they think is important. 
So when we talk about anything in serverless, we must find out what their concerns are. What they do right now that we can make better, what serverless will make better. And more than just make it better, more than just tell them the glory of this new world that is super cool and we like, we have to show our work. We have to show them how to meet their goals, how to meet their own needs, to do better in the system that surrounds them. And a friend told me a story once about trying to get Docker and CI CD into their dev pipeline at work. And this is a large institution, like very staid, very stable, with a very, very firm change management process. And Docker and CI CD, well, politically, you may have um, bumped into this that they don't, that they're often incompatible with you know, pre existing change management processes. And this incompatibility was reflected in organizational attempts to use it. This was exemplified by the person in charge of change management pushing back like, really hard because their context prevented technical changes. It didn't matter how technically good or not good this solution was, contextually it was inappropriate. The system had demands that they had to meet. So the team trying to get CICD in, Docker in, listened to those concerns. They took them on board and built a demo. And they said, this is how we build artifacts. This is what Docker and CICD and all of these things can give you in your frame of mind, in your context. This is what you get out of our new process. Does this meet your needs? And it did. The change management, change management manager got more out of this new process and was better able to do their job than under the old processes. And that's important to consider. Because as I've been saying for a while, like the last half hour, your context and goals really aren't relevant to them or their goals. You kind of don't matter. So we have to make ourselves matter. And that is a framing shift to where we have to think about how we're part of a larger whole, part of other people's goals, how we enable those goals, how our technology is an amplifier for them. So you need to go out and find out what their context is. You need to listen and not argue. No, really, <laughs> one of the biggest mistakes that we keep making, and I have made this so many times, is especially when I'm passionate, is that, that trying to argue my points, trying to argue about how their context or goals are misguided or incorrect, that, that my take is correct. We do this all the time, like, and we do it live. I'm explaining serverless, and they go, well, that doesn't work. And I try to argue, no. And this, this is like the beginning of a very long conversation about contempt culture as well that I'm just not going to get into today, but find me afterwards if you want to know more. The argument devalues their needs. It frames them that we don't think they're relevant or important. It tells them that they should ignore us. This as a whole, this thing I've explained is the DevOps mentality, the dismantling of silos, the treating of other skills with respect and admiration, of listening to the context and needs of others. And this is why I say serverless cannot save us. By talking about serverless only as a technology, we're ignoring the things that make DevOps special. And yes, serverless is an extension of DevOps. We ignore the way it lets us build new cultures, the way it lets us think of others' needs as important too. By itself, serverless is just a new silo. It's just a new means of creating exclusivity. Just a way of saying, only my needs and desires matter. And we can be better than that. So serverless can't save us. Not by itself. Or not by ourselves. And I'd love to be able to give you magical guidance for your company and magical solutions to all of these problems. But I can't. Magical solutions don't exist. What you can do as I said, is go out and listen. Listen to needs and goals and desires. Listen, and in so listening, hear what you need to make adoption a reality. And by working together, by understanding others' needs and goals and context, we can initiate that change. We can make that difference. We can make adoption happen. We can. 
make it work. Thank you.